We thank you for the privilege, the honor, and the opportunity you give us, Lord, to do life together with each other, but especially with you a part of it. And Lord, we just thank you as this day is the day of Pentecost, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit continues to move in our lives and lead us and direct us in every aspect of every fiber of our being, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, and Calvary Chapel. Praying you guys are doing great this Sunday morning. Amen. God is good all the time. Would you like to stand with us so we can worship this morning?
train of his road build the temple the angels circle around it and cry
Give God a mighty shout of praise this morning. Amen. Yeah, God work. Somebody's trying to steal a car outside. Well, good morning and uh, welcome. Last week I did an introduction on the book of Acts or the church and I feel like I, I need to do one more week of just kind of an introduction, getting started in it, um, talk about a couple of things because I'm doing this for you, but I'm also doing this for me as a pastor and a leader just to kind of get my bearings on my future and, and, and what the Lord has for me um, with Calvary Chapel and, and as far as the leadership goes and being a pastor. And because we're studying the book of Acts, Acts is the beginning of the church and the Holy Spirit, you know, bringing us as believers together and, and for a purpose. And um, I thought it was very important that we kind of look at where the church is at today and how far we've come and uh, just to kind of see where we're at as opposed to how it started and kind of its purpose when it first was happening and kind of what the Holy Spirit's purpose was for bringing us together. And, you know, today's the day of Pentecost that Jim brought to my attention and uh, it was the day, 50 days after uh, the Lord was resurrected, that uh, the Holy Spirit came and changed the world. And, um, and so I think Calvary Chapel is a, is a good place to start. You know, to, we start with us. We start with our house and kind of who we are as a church and our purpose and our goals and kind of how we've evolved over the years. And, you know, we started out just doing Bible studies in my backyard with my parents and my in-laws, just us wanting to just, we, we, we felt like the church that we were a part of was going in a different direction than our hearts were going. We didn't know a lot of churches. I didn't know about Baptists. I didn't know about um, Methodists. I didn't really know any other denominations. I grew up Catholic. I grew up Catholic going to vacation Bible school at Baptist churches. So I did get some Bible stories, you know what I mean, from the, from the vacation Bible schools. But, but Mostly it was from the Catholic Church and just from, from the Catholic religion and just kind of what they brought to the table. And, um, but, I, but I had, a, as many people do, we have this something inside of us that tells us there's more. It seems like that's across the board, across cultures, across races, just across the world. I mean, there's something innate in us that just tells us there's something but here's the thing um, about the church today as opposed to the church back then. Oh, that's not the one. Uh, the church back then was moved by the Holy Spirit and was faced severe persecution. Uh, Tozer, one of the great preachers out there, said that if the Holy Spirit were taken away from the church today, the Holy Spirit were taken away from the church today that you probably couldn't tell the difference and that 95% of what a church does would probably continue to do. But he said if you took the Holy Spirit away from the early church, 95% of what they did would be taken away and there would only be a little bit, and you would know the difference because, because in the, the persecution that was alive during those days, and I want to talk about that, Nero's persecution of the Christians in Rome just shortly, just 30 years after Christ 
died on a cross. The church was only alive for 30 years. And in those 30 years, thousands of people came to believe, but also thousands of people were martyred. People don't die for something they fake believe in. People will not give up their lives for a fake something. They give up their lives for something they actually believe in. You don't give up your, you don't, you don't go to the cross because you're just not going to tell the truth because you're going to hold on to this lie to the very end. There's only a few people like George Costanza would do that. Would die with a lie because he didn't want to tell the truth. But the rest of us, no, no, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. If you were put to the test and they were going to execute you, I don't believe. I, 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 was, I, act like, I thought I believed, but I'm not really a believer. And they would, they would, they would save their skin. But some people say, and you, there are testimonies of those that say, Lord, it's an honor to go to the cross. It's an honor to be put to death. Only the Holy Spirit and the truth can, can, can take a man to that place. And so I think it's important that we look and see how things are spirit-led. I mean, what does spirit-led mean? How do, how do we know if we're spirit-led? Well, I'll tell you one way that I um, lead is I trust the Lord for one, and I don't pass an offering plate. And for me, that is between me and the Lord in my walk with the Lord, not for every preacher out there, not for every other minister out there, but between me and the Lord, I said, Lord, I, I don't want to find myself ever in a position to manipulate for any reason. Please, Lord. So, if I put a box back there, thank the people for just doing their service and their understanding of, of their relationship with the Lord, doing what they know that you've told them to do and how much and what not and do it, then I'll know if it's you, Lord. If every week there's enough to do the next week, I'll know I'm supposed to go another week, Lord, and then I'll know that you're leading me there, Lord. And you know what, Lord? I, um, when, the, when Joplin tornado hit, when, the, when, the, when Hurricane Katrina hit, I remember thinking and listening to people that are going, Never thought about going. Never thought about being a part of that. Just listened to other people. Then I thought, I could support somebody, send $25 to somebody that's going to do that. And then somebody said, why don't you go? I went, I could probably go. I got the means. I could take off. I work for myself. I could schedule my schedule. I could, I could go. Why not go? And I go, Lord, am I supposed to do something like this? How do I know if I can go? Well, because you just told yourself you could go. <laughs> you, you can go. And, and, and listen, the devil's not going to tell you to go. The devil's not going to tell you to put yourself out there. I promise you that, unless it's to kill you or in a bad deal. But So I went. And man, it was such a blessing. Then, then, then Joplin, Missouri, my, our friend David, who was my assistant pastor, uh, David Turner, who was my assistant pastor back then, his sisters were right in the, the, the zone where the tornado just flattened neighborhoods. That night, he was in his truck going up there when he knew the tornado hit. The next day, I remember just saying, what can we do to help? And, 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 and so we just decided we'd get some stuff together, and we would somehow take it up there. And then next thing you know, we took 30 people up there. And, and, and God blessed it. And I'm, and I'm seeing that God took that, and then he blessed us financially. He blessed us with people. And, and then when we got down there, we were blessing the people. And I'm just saying, look how easy it is to be led by the Lord and just to see that it works out because he supplies for it. He, he provides the supplies for it. I was in the tile business for 30 years, 30 years in the tile business, and, and, and I enjoyed it on the most part. I enjoyed working for myself. I enjoyed the, the, the ability to make money, to, to hustle, but what I learned in the tile business was how to manage things, and I could see, and looking back, I said, Holy Spirit, you moved me in that job, and you put me here, and, and you, you put, because I could walk into a room and just know what to do and manage 20 people. And it just became a gift. And I just thought, Lord, I can't do any of this stuff without you. I don't, I don't have the confidence, for one thing, 
to do any of these things without knowing the Holy Spirit's with me. And so I, I needed to show you some things. Um, and, I, and I mentioned this to you a while back, and I got, I got these, three, these few different graphs just to show you that the cultures over the, over the centuries, over the, the millennia, has always been the king and then priests and, and advisors in that second column. Always, always, always. And every... In every government, and in every institution across the world, the priests were always number two because, because people are looking for the Lord. They're looking for God. They're just looking for him. And there's people in the way of him. There's many, many people in the way. They're everywhere. That's what about Tozer said. In, in 2 Timothy, Paul is telling us, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Because for the time will come. Now, can I ask you something? We're 2,000 years after this. Do you think maybe the time has come? What does the time has come for? When they will not endure sound doctrine. There are over 60, I believe, 60,000 Christian denominations or more. Thousands of Christian denominations. Why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many? It's, it's baffling. Because that's not biblical to even name a movement. It's not biblical. They were just referred to as those Christ followers or, the, or those or them or the way. They were even called the way one time. They weren't called Christian. They were called the way. And, and, and yet, immediately after the church started, the Holy Spirit came on and started moving on people. Nero blamed the Christians for trying to burn down Rome, and next thing you know, there was this, this all-out just persecution, not even because of Christ, even though Satan knows it was because of Christ. They were just using them for a scapegoat because they were just a new faction of new people doing a new thing, believing a new thing, and they were just easily chosen because they had no history to blame for the problem of Rome. And so they wiped them out. They fed them to animals. They, they, just, they literally would douse people in blood and then sick lions on them who hadn't eaten for weeks. They would, he would dip Christians in wax and burn them as candles in his garden. Who, who, would, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't say, I'm not a Christian. I ain't going to get burned as a candle unless there was a power. It was moving these people into a place where they realized that their lives on this earth were not willing, not worthy to reject Christ. They understood something. There was a power working in them that they understood that made them confident that they could trust and believe. If you don't understand what that is, you're missing out. If you don't have the Holy Spirit and the ability to march through darkness with confidence and resilience because you trust the Word of God. Listen, when I first became a Christian, it wasn't easy to trust the Word of God. I didn't have nothing to base it on. <laughs> I had no life experience as a Christian. But I knew in my heart and my spirit that something had happened, and I was not going to reject it, even if my flesh says, forget it. This ain't worth it. Your wife left you. There ain't nothing here. Just go back. And, you just, and, it was, and that voice was correct in many aspects. But it lied to me because it told me God didn't care for me and was just going to leave me out there and didn't care about my marriage, didn't care about my wife, didn't care about my family, didn't care about none of these things. That's what Satan told me. And as I looked at it, it didn't look like he did because he sure wasn't taking care of it the way I thought he should take care of it. But that's when I learned to stop looking with my eyes and start trusting with my heart. Quit looking. Quit looking at the world around and just start trusting. At that moment, I started a tile business, went out on my own, and became very successful in that tile business for 30 years. Made a name for myself. Tiled for big to little houses all over town. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm the guy that drives around and says, I tiled that, son. I tiled that house, son. I did that right there, son. 
You can still go around Waco and see tile that I had none around town, just like many guys can. And, and I was proud of that fact. But now, I'm proud that I stand here, not because I'm a proud man, but because I understand that my faith 20 years ago is paying off. My faith 30 years ago is paying off. My faith five years ago is paying off. My trust is paying off. And I'm telling you, it's because the church has been a part of my life and the Holy Spirit is a part of my life. It's paying off. And there is a payoff, but it's not, I'm not even at the greatest payoff yet. I got one great payoff waiting for me when I cross over. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables, but you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Does this look like something that you sign up for? Do you read something like this and go, oh, I'll sign up for the afflictions part. I'll sign up for the hard life part. I'll sign, up for, uh, sign, off, uh, sign up for that. No, none of us signs up for that. We sign up for eternal life. We sign up because we know we're guilty of our sins. But we didn't sign up for the other stuff but we're assigned to it. Because as we're assigned to it, it's a testimony. It's a testimony to the throne room of God that we are true believers when we've pushed through our own thoughts and our own flesh for truth, for what we know is right, for, we, for what we know is to be right. Listen, God uses the, the ways of this world to train us about heavenly laws, about heavenly things. We have, to, we have to do the, do the works of this life to learn about that life. We have to live life with each other and go through crap with each other so that we can understand that world and that place that doesn't have all that. We go through it here so we don't go through it there. We step in it down here so we don't step in it up there. Right? We take care of the mess here. This is where we get unmessy. This is where God cleans us up. This is where God... Puts us together. A church is where that takes place, not brings division. This isn't about who's in control, who's the, who's the leader, who has control of this or who has control of that. We don't operate like that around here. We don't, we don't, I don't, look, I am responsible for what I know I'm responsible for, but I also know that none of this is mine. Do you know that? Did I know that? I know that none of it's mine, although I'm the general manager of a lot of it. It's not mine. It's ours. It's to be used for us. And we're going to get into that as we journey. And then he says this. this because Luke writes this gospel. And, and, and it's interesting who, who, who Luke is and, and how we can trust Luke. But it says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Notice that this is the first century church. The first century church, shortly after Jesus ascended back into heaven and brought the Holy Spirit, it says, come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. We have many Demases still alive today, but Paul's got them in the first century. And as the bar departed for Thessalonica, Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. So Luke is an interest, interesting character in the life of Paul. And then he says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. That's a great character study on, on patience with, with, with a man. And then he says, um, bring some other special stuff for me. But in 14, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You must also be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me. All forsook me. May it not be charged against them. 
Listen, being a Christian is not easy in that first century. Having the Holy Spirit lead and guide the church was not easy in that first century. It cannot be easy for us now. What's hard for us now is to learn to balance this world and our spiritual life. What's hard for us now is to learn to balance, walk a balanced life out, to find where your part is in the plan. What gift you bring to the overall plan. When, when, I, for years, I was a, just, a, just a contractor, just doing tile work. But as the years progressed, my last fun job was building this church with my buddy Rosie. Being the contractor of this church and having to work with so many different contractors. Usually, I'm just the guy that says, stay off my floor. But now as a contractor, you're going, hey, guy, get your floor ready because I need guys stepping on it. Because the position changes, and because, see, the tile guy just wants to worry about the tile stuff. When I got in there, I wouldn't care. I didn't necessarily think about the electrician. I didn't necessarily think about everybody else unless my job was going to mess them up. But I only went in there to do my job. But when I became the general contractor, my job was to work everybody together. To to make it flow. That's the Holy Spirit's job to use men and women to make it flow, to make it work together. You you can't just be somebody that takes from the ministry. You got to be part of the ministry. Listen, there are avenues and abilities to be a part of the blessings, but there's there's also a part that's required of us. We read in the book of Exodus, they all came together and they put everything into one pile. Everybody wants to do is come over and just check out the pile. And then keep their pile over here. That's not how it works. We're in this together. And so he lets us know that there's not always a lot of love. But he also tells us who this Luke was. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. This is before Demas took off. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. And so he tells us that Luke was a faithful brother. There are 45,000 denominations globally. Followers of Jesus span the globe, but the global body of more than 2 billion Christians is separated into thousands of denominations, Pentecostals, whatnot, everything. And then you got the pastors that are making millions off the church. Kenneth Copeland's net worth is really said to, from, a, from an insider, says more like 700 million rather than 300 million, and um, all but two of those are American, two are Nigerian, Uh, but all those are American. I mentioned to you last week as we looked at the, the, the world and talked about the money of the world and how all the poorest nations of the world have more believers in them. The poorer the nation, the more believers, or the more, the, the more uh, religious they were. The richer you were, the less religious you were. The only rich nation that had a high percentage of believers was the United States. Of all the countries, we are one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest country in the world so far on paper, and yet we have the highest percentage of believers than anybody else of the rich countries. There's something special about us, but there's something not special about us at the same time. There's something special about us because we, we, we're not poor. We're not poor. I don't care. You're not poor. If you have a toilet, you are not poor. If you have a refrigerator, you are not poor. If you have a dwelling, you're not poor. So we're not poor here. In Revelation chapter 3, he writes to a church in the last days. I believe. And it's interesting that this church is the lukewarm church. And he says, these things says the amen, because we don't want to become this church. That's why I'm showing you this. The faithful and the true witness, the beginning of creation, God, of God. I'm at the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I know your works, because listen, we're busy with works. Now, I do a lot of works. I pray that mine are holy works and blessed works and not just works. The church should have works. So there's nothing wrong with that. There should be works. But he says, I know your works. But then he says this, that you are neither cold nor hot. 
I could wish that you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And then he throws this back on us. You do not know. And that's, that's, that's interesting because most people in poverty know they're in poverty. Most people that are broke know they're broke. Most people that don't have anything know they don't have nothing. But it's interesting that people that have something like this doesn't know what they don't have or what they do have or where they're at. You do not know that you are wretched and, and, and miserable. <laughs> you don't even know you're miserable. Ain't that something? You don't even know you're miserable. Poor, blind, naked. I counsel to you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. And as, as many as I love, listen, this is the beautiful part. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Now listen, he's talking about having to overcome some mental things, some mental perceptions, some mental attitudes. He's talking about we're going to need to overcome some, some ideas that we have. Listen, as Christians, you are to be givers. We're all called to be givers. To what degree? That's between you and the Lord. And to what means you give? That's between you and the Lord as well. There's, there's, there's no set percentage on New Testament giving other than giving. And, and listen, each because I give not just money, I give it myself. I, I give up my barbecue pit. I give up my time. I'll give up whatever I need to to honor the Lord. I'll, I'll do that. But you know, that, that's just unique for me, and I'm, I'm different. I'm in a different place. But we're all called to listen to what he says. Another purpose of the church in the, in, in, in the New Testament that we're going to read about, he says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Do we live in a perverse generation? I would think so. I mean, you can't even go to Target again these days. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. Now that day, those people became a target for the enemy. On that day, they became an enemy of the state, and there was a target put on their back. You and I have lived... You may be told you can't wear that shirt to school or shirt to work. You can't preach it at your job. You may be told stuff like that, but that is not persecution at all. Persecution is when you lose things because of your faith, when you lose your house because of your faith, when they begin to take things away from you. You look at Canada, you look at some of these other places, if you say the wrong thing, if you mispronoun somebody, because your faith doesn't allow you to give in to some of that idiot stuff, you could lose your job. You could lose, you could start losing your rights. You could start losing some things in other countries. Thank God we're not there yet, but there's legislation out there. They're trying to condemn our words. And it's funny because our words are not harmful. Our words are good words. But to be a believer... In America, it's a blessing and it's a curse. It's a blessing because I like cheeseburgers. And as an American Christian, I can have a cheeseburger. But at the same time, I can find myself at home in, ap in an apathetic state, which is just sit there and not do nothing and be a part of nothing and just let the world go by and just enjoy my piece of heaven. And, I, and, and 
that's what the world wants to do, but that's not what we are called to do. And I don't want to be a church that just comes to church. I don't want to just be a church that just comes to church. I want a church that, that involves itself, but we don't want to just, look, I had, I had a guy, you know, come to church, he wanted to come to church, and he called me up, and he's my friend, and, and but, but man, it seemed like all he ever does is want something, and it's, and it's, and it's hard. When, when all they do is, man, I'm in this, oh, man, I'm, I'm here, oh, man, you know, and I'm, I'm, I, I get it, I get it, you know, it is tough out there, but you know what I've learned? I've learned that um, if, if you listen to the Lord, he will guide you. It may not be, you know, it may not be the job you want. How many people work the job they want, you know? But look, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That's, that's important, that we continue steadfastly, not my doctrine, but the apostles' doctrine that, we're, that we are studying. And then it says, in the breaking, in, in fellowship, and then breaking of bread and prayers. Now, that, see, we got that one down. We got the breaking bread down. We got the prayers down. And then it says this, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, people always want to know why signs and wonders aren't done. Is it because we're not believers? And is it because we don't? Because apparently we are believers. If, if you look on paper, it says we're believers. Well, it, it, imagine this, the very beginning when the, when, the, when the Lord first started ministering, when he would say something... He, he would have evidence to his word. There would be an evidence to his word. He would be a witness to something that was already said. And so when he would do miracles and he healed and he brought people back to life, those were signs of who he were. Those, those were miracles, but every single one of those people died again. Did they not? Every single one of those people died. So it wasn't death that he came to keep us from or dying that he came to keep us from. He didn't just heal people to bring them back to life and just give them a good life so they can go back and eat more tacos. He brought them back to be a witness. He brought them back as a witness to those people that saw the miracles. And so what God does is he used all those miracles and the apostles' signs and wonders so that people would go, there's something with these guys. There's something, there's something to, they're, 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 they're not just coming with words, they're coming in power. But at this point, the Holy Spirit has done a work. I wasn't saved because I saw somebody raised from the dead. How many of you were saved because you saw somebody raised from the dead? How many of you were saved because you saw somebody healed? How many of you were saved because you saw somebody's blind eyes open? How many were saved because they were at a bad place in their life? Because you were at a bad place in your life and you knew there was nowhere else to go and somebody had shared the gospel with you and you got on your knees and you said, Lord, I need help. <laughs> That's how most of us come to the Lord. The Holy Spirit does his job well. Me and you, if we did signs and wonders, Albert Fuentes Ministries would be right on top of that. My name would be right there, Albert Fuentes. Come, come let him lay hands on you. Bring your checkbook. I don't want the Holy Spirit to be a spectacle. I'll... I, 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 I want the Holy Spirit to be evident by the evidence of our lives, by the evidence of the ministries, the evidence of the testimonies. And, and one of the things that, that, that we're learning about Calvary Chapel is that people can count on Calvary Chapel in this community to come together. Over the years, we've done funerals for people we didn't know. We offered to do funerals for people that we didn't know. And not only did we offer to do funerals, we offered to feed them, families and their people, uh, after the funeral. Do you know why? Because those were tender moments for us to be good examples in the hands and feet of Christ because those are, that's the most vulnerable time of somebody's life and the family. And these are opportunities for the church to be at the right place at the right time showing the right kind of love to people that need it the most. Nobody seeks out funerals intentionally. But listen, I'm an opportunist. I'm an opportunist. I see opportunities and I want to take advantage of them for the kingdom, not for my pocketbook, not for the glory of us or for the glory of me, but for the glory of, of who we are, of our church and, and our fellowship and, and who we've come to be. The days to come, we will be doing some things. We will show the neighborhood. We would be more evangelistic. We will, 
we will do the job the church is supposed to do is shine and draw. Shine and draw people to Christ. That's our goal. And you can, listen, if you keep coming, the pressure's going to be on for you to be a part of this. The pressure's going to be on for you to do your part because we are called to do these things. We have those things happen. We have baptisms. We have fellowship. We've been doing these things for years. We haven't had a baptism in a while, but we're ready to, for anybody that's ready to be baptized. But, but we do these things. This church is about these things. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, and he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors, teachers. Why did he give them? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, knowledge, uh, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And it seems like the unity of the faith is going in different directions sometimes. It seems like we all believe in different things. Right? And it brings dissension. When I, when, I, when I got saved, I didn't know that there were Pentecostals. I never heard the word Pentecostals. I didn't, I didn't know what that was. I knew what Baptists were, Catholics, and Methodists. Other than that, I don't remember really growing up thinking about Church of Christ, Episcopal, whatever. I didn't think about all those. But I've noticed that the smaller churches sometimes are the most powerful ones. Sometimes it's the ones that are, that, are, that, are, that are small, you know, we're right there. We're right there. We don't want to, you know, I, don't, I pray we don't get too, too many people in here that we're unmanageable. But I hope we, we have a good, strong core of people willing to, to be the hands and feet of Christ when it's needed. We're the church that does that. But we also have to be weary of those that are coming in and causing dissension and, and struggles because it happens. We just read that Paul struggled with that. But our purpose is to come to the unity of the faith, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, which is the most important. To be a perfect, to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, and the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer, listen, be tossed, be, be, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He is warning us about churches doing these very things. That's what he's saying. He's telling us to be careful, to, 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 be, on, to be on the watch for these things. And, and then we, you see these guys using the church to become millionaires and, and to get ahead in the world. I never imagined my life would be this blessed being a pastor because I never saw being a pastor as a goal to be, you know, financially overwhelmed. That's not what I, I wanted just enough. And this is what I prayed, Lord, give me just enough. Take care of my family, do the things I need to, and that I don't steal. <laughs> don't, don't, don't have, you know, that's, just, that's a prayer. Lord, give me enough. That I don't forget about you. Don't give me too much where I forget about you. Don't give me too little where I feel like I got to steal. Don't just give me enough. And, and that's what I pray here. I'm not praying. I'm, I don't, I don't want to go down in history as a good pastor. I want to go down in history as a good servant. I want to go in history as a good leader, a good servant, a good father, a good grandfather, a good friend. That's what I want to go down in history for. Those other things aren't in the church. There's, there's not supposed to be highlights on any one person. There's just not. That's, not. that's not the church. It's supposed to be on Jesus Christ and him alone always, always, always Jesus Christ. In Romans 12, he says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. These are things the church is supposed to do for each other. And then he says this, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to instruct and build one another up. We're to be training ground for preachers and evangelists. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. These are some of the toughest things to, to go through in America 
because we're so prideful and arrogant a lot of times. We, we don't want to be wrong. We're always right. We're always right. We don't like to be wrong. I don't like to be wrong either, but if I am wrong, I need to know I'm wrong. Right? If I'm wrong, I need to know I'm wrong. Therefore, encourage each other. Build one another up, just as you are also doing. I like that part. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Now, notice what he says. You can tell the difference. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Boom. Nor is he who does not love his brother. One, you can't always recognize. One is easy to recognize. One is not always easy to recognize. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. One of the things that, that, that make our church special is that we have a prayer group that meets every Monday. Every Monday. They've not failed, except during COVID, to meet during a Monday. They meet every Monday, been meeting every Monday. For, I can't remember how many, how many years now, since almost the beginning, forever, since 2009, 8, 9, something, way back then. They've been praying. Every Monday, they, they pray at Stevenson's house most of the time. They pray at the Pollard's house once a month. Listen, that's a great place to get to know people that you never met. There's a lot of, uh, I call my orphans from out of town. Some other places live here with no other family. We're their family. They're there. It's a great place to meet up. We don't have our bulletins today. We, we, we had a problem with the bulletins, so we don't have the, the information. But you can go to our website and find out about it. But listen, a church is a place to fellowship and prayer. And the prayer group is a great, great place to do that. And then we're told, you know, but be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your quests be made known to God. I believe that one of my, that I have, that I find the most confidence in my decision making is, is when I pray and I know that the prayer team is praying and then I make a decision, I go, Lord, I trust that this decision was based in prayer and I'm going to make it, and we're going to do it, and we do it, and we, we, we and, it, and it, so far, so good. On the most part, <laughs> it looks like that. So far, so good. But it says, let your requests be made known, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That, I can't tell you how important that is, that your minds and your hearts are guarded by the Holy Spirit when you're actively moving with the Lord in all these aspects. You cannot be an island to yourself as a Christian. You can't. You can't, you can't be an island to yourself. You're not called to do it alone. We're called to do this together, and I appreciate everybody that's stuck with me and um, continues to trust me in, in, in this position of leadership and in my, my role. And, uh, and as we get into the book of Acts, I pray that our church, other than you know, some of the supernatural aspects that the Lord used to draw people to the church. Other than those things, I pray that uh, we have lots to offer, not just to fancy your fancy, but to, to equip you and to grow you and to get you ready for heaven. Because you want to be ready for heaven, right? Because that's our goal and that's our destiny. And I pray that uh, not only are we ready, but that we're equipped to help other people get to that place as well. Amen? Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask you as we just move forward as a church, as Calvary Chapel, Lord God, that you just give me the wisdom to guide this group of believers, Lord, and those that you bring. And Father, I pray for those that, that, that have left and, and, and those that will leave, Lord, that you'll just use them and and, and keep them close to you, Lord God, because we are not exclusive to you and Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we just ask you to fill us with wisdom and knowledge as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I, I, I passed eight churches on the way here. I guarantee you most of you passed at least five churches on the way here. And it blew me away that you would pass so many churches to find your way to this one. And it's an honor that you did that. And I pray that um, our goal and our mission is where God's heart has you with our heart. Amen? Amen. God bless you.